First Timothy for beginners, lesson number six, elders, deacons, and the church, part one. And uh, if you're following along in your Bibles, chapter three of First Timothy, we'll pick it up uh, in a moment here in verse number eight. All right, so um, last week we looked at the role of leaders in the church, that was the focus of our study. And we said basically, if we want to summarize, uh, leaders in the church, mature married men, experienced Christians with virtuous characters who are focused on spiritual things and not worldly things. We also examine what we called these men, terms that we used. There were three in particular, uh, a bishop, which uh, alluded to that person's authority, the term elder, which spoke of that individual's maturity, and pastor, which described the way that this individual did their uh, ministry. All the names always referring to the same person. For example, we have one of our elders here, Harold. Uh, if we called him Bishop Harold, that would be fine. That would simply uh, you know, uh, underline the authority that he has along with the other elders as leaders in the church. We could also call him Elder Harold because he is an older and experienced man and we could just as well call him Pastor Harold because of the shepherding ministry that he performs again along with the other elders in the church. We also reviewed the work of uh, these leaders again basically to guard the flock against false teaching and teachers. That's the primary work of the elders. Also to promote unity and peace and growth and to minister to those who are weak spiritually um, and sick physically. And then finally we touched on how these men come into their position of leadership. And basically we said they're trained and appointed by a, either a missionary, if it's a new church, or an evangelist, or other elders when, uh, they're already, when they've already been uh, appointed. But the key was they're always appointed. They never appoint themselves. They're always appointed by others. So uh, tonight we're going to study what responsibility the church has in response to the leaders and follow up by looking at another group of servants in the church referred to as deacons. So we looked at the, the elders, you know, how are they to you know, interact with the church? Now it's going to be, well, how does the church interact with the, with the leaders? There are several scriptures that deal with this very subject. How are we to treat those who lead and minister uh, in the church? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul writes here, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work, live in peace with one another. So esteem or consider them highly doesn't mean to revere them, you know bowing, kneeling, kissing the ring. You know, we see that in other denominational groups. The high leaders receive that kind of reverence uh, from uh, those who are under them. But this isn't what this word uh, means. It means respect them for what they do, not just for the special role that God has given them. Let's note two things here. One, they oversee in this passage. He said, these people, they oversee, they have charged, they're responsible in the Lord. God gives them authority. There was a movement in the church a while back where people were saying, well, you know, the elders, do they really have you know, leadership? Yeah, sure, they absolutely do have leadership. And there are many scriptures that uh, support uh, that idea. Uh, also, Paul refers to more than one, again, the plurality in church leadership. There's always more than one elder, more than one pastor or bishop uh, in each congregation. Esteeming or respecting in love is demonstrated how? How do you do that? Well, not by bowing and scraping, but rather by kindness, cooperation, encouragement. Respect also includes the idea that we realize that they're human beings, just like we are but they have a great task to do, so we need to be careful not to criticize unjustly. Even elders need God's grace and the church's patience with them um, at times. And so in a word, respect is the first response of the church 
towards uh, its leaders. Another passage, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, the writer says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So submit to their teachings in Christ. As individuals with free will, we still retain individual responsibilities for knowing and you know, respecting the truth and obeying the truth. The main task of elders is to maintain and teach the truth of the scriptures. So if a church leader accurately teaches the Bible, we're bound to obey. We're not obeying him, he's not the boss. We're obeying what he's teaching us through the scriptures, okay? First of all, because it's God's truth that we're hearing, not His. And secondly, because God's legitimate church leader is the one teaching or preaching this word to us. Of course, obedience and submission is conditional on the fact that they are actually leading according to the Spirit and the word of God. You know, if the elder gets up and says, you know what, I, I, I've been looking at the Bible and I've come to the conclusion that you know, Jesus, nah, he's not the son of God. He was just a rabbi, he wasn't divine, and he didn't resurrect from the dead. All of that stuff is just, you know, it's just hearsay. Well, you know, we would be having a very serious discussion with that elder, right? Uh, why? Well, because he's teaching things that are not according to the word of God. And I think we know that here. I think we're, mature enough in this class to understand that idea. The, the writer also adds a word of warning not to make a leader's life difficult, disobedient, lazy, indifferent, rebellion, because those who do will be punished. Leaders have a responsibility to lead and the church has a responsibility to follow when that leadership is in Christ. Another passage, Hebrews 13 verse seven, Writer says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the results of their conduct, imitate their faith. So what does he say here? First of all, he says, remember them. This is done uh, in an actual manner when we pray for our leaders. You know, remember our leaders, how do we do that? Many times, even some of you here who are leading a prayer uh, during the uh, worship service, I, I've heard you say, and Lord, please bless our leaders and give them wisdom and so on and so forth. That's remembering our leaders in our prayers. Uh, we also remember them by implementing their teachings, obeying, listening, submission. This is a passive form of respect. Prayer and implementation of their teachings in our lives, that's an active form of respect. And then he says, imitate them. Look at their lives, look at their conduct and see what it has produced in their lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and so on and so forth. Imitate what they have done in faith in order to produce the same in your own lives. Even though I've been you know, working as a minister for many, many years, there are elders in this congregation who have surpassed the length of service that I've offered to the church by decades. And I look to their example. When I get a little tired and a little, whew, you know, this is getting hard, you know, I look at them and I say, wow, brother so-and-so has been an elder for like 40 years or something. I, I want to imitate their perseverance. I want to imitate the patience that they've had throughout the years leading this church. So imitation is a key principle in the Christian life and in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's the system we use to learn and grow. We imitate uh, Christ, don't we? Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. We imitate the apostles, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. We imitate the elders and the leaders in the church, Hebrews 13, 7. We imitate other churches, 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, 13. So we learn and we grow by observing and imitating all of the examples that God has left for us for this very purpose. I mean, we're studying about leaders in the church, not just as like to get head knowledge, we're studying it so we can learn something to apply to our own lives. Perhaps uh, you younger men to perhaps uh, aspire to that kind of leadership uh, in, the, in the future. You know, elders are usually the first ones we see and observe to help us know what we want to become. 
Another passage of scripture, 1 Timothy 5, uh, 19 to 22, he says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin, meaning those elders, if there's an elder who's continuing in sin, he says, those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of His chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So what else do we do? Remember, we're talking about how does the church respond to the elders? Well, Paul says there are times when you have to hold them accountable. Sometimes there are conflicts concerning leaders and members, or the leaders do not act appropriately. And Paul touches on this, he touches on this in, in, in Timothy. So um, uh, what are we not to do? Well, no gossiping. It's easy to get together and criticize leaders, but this doesn't do any good for the leaders or for the church or for ourselves. If there is a true problem, if there is a true sin, an offense, let it be done by at least two individuals who can be witnesses. Not, I heard. You can't be a witness if you say, I heard, somebody told me, that doesn't make you a witness. <laughs> you have to be a witness. You have to have seen the thing, whatever it is. And it has to be a sin. It has to be an offense, not something that bugs you. You know, that elder, he bugs me. What does he do? Well, I don't know, he talks too, he talks too long. You know, I say hello and then you know, he just keeps talking to me for five minutes. Well, that's not an offense. I mean, I'm just picking something a little foolish there, but you know what I'm saying. It has to be a real sin. Not just something that you don't like. And try to bring it to his attention you know, Jesus teaches us, if your brother sins against you, what do you do? You go to him. Biggest, biggest problem in the church. And boy, I can, I can be a witness to this. I've seen it over and over again. Something happens between A and B. And what happens? A goes to see C instead of going to see B. In other words, instead of seeing the person that has offended him or done something wrong and say, hey, can we talk? You know, you said this. No, no, they don't do that. They go tell somebody else. I don't, I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said, you know, you need to go see brother Joe over here uh, because he did this to me. And I say, have you spoken to brother Joe? No, why not? Well, I thought you'd take care of it. No, 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 that's not how it works. That's not how the Bible tells us to solve these problems. You just make it worse that way. At least, hopefully, at least if he tells the preacher Hopefully the preacher has the, 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 you know, the, the common sense to kind of direct him back. But what happens a lot of times, they won't even tell the minister or the elder. They'll tell their buddy and then they'll round up a posse. <laughs> you know? And yeah, and that's how division happens in, in, in the church. So try to bring it, if it's an elder now, getting back to our topic, uh, try to bring it to his attention. And Paul says, if there's no repentance, nothing, bring it to the church. Another thing, uh, let's not favor one man over another. You know, there's one elder that we're buddies with and you know, so on and so forth and we want to have something happen so we circumvent all the other elders and we just go to our buddy elder and we put a bug in his ear. Nah, that's not the way to do business. We need to treat all of them with respect and if a rebuke is necessary then fine. And don't put a man in a leadership position too quickly. If he's not ready, he's going to fall. And those who put him there will share the responsibility for his errors because of his inexperience. So elders, again, ordinary men who are weak and sinful. So there, there has to be a kind of a mechanism to correct them or to remove them if they're not fit to lead. And Paul explains what that is in this brief passage here. Another passage talking about our you know, response to elders. 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18, he says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. 
For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is uh, worthy of his uh, wages. So basically, honor them. In the early church, the evangelists went from place to place establishing churches, or they were teaching and preaching at ones that were already established, or they were preaching publicly from place to place. It was a more transient type of lifestyle for preachers in the first century in the early church. The elders, however, bishops, pastors, they were the men who led in the local churches as permanent members who remained with the same church. So Paul encourages the church to highly value these men, double honor. Their hard work and great spiritual responsibilities were to be honored in the proper way. Just like he uses the ox, you, know, you have an ox and the ox is doing your work for you, you need to feed the animal. Well, in the same way, leaders are worthy of double honor. The honor we give to all brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as the additional honor due to those who lead well in uh, the church. Some people say, well, this also would mean double honor that we also could pay them for their services. And I, that's a good argument. You can, people have argued that back and forth, but uh, whatever position you take on that, you're not straining the passage here for taking that, uh, for taking that position. Obviously, if, uh, if there's an elder that's working, preaching and teaching, and that's, he's doing only that, yeah, he is, uh, we're, well, we have one, right? One of our elders is also uh, our public minister. Uh, so uh, one question that comes up about elders uh, is uh, how long can they hold their position? Uh, do they have to retire at a certain age? Should the church you know, review their work or renew them like a contract every year? Some churches do that. The Bible, however, doesn't give any information on that particular topic. It gives us the qualifications, it gives us the work to be done, it gives us also you know, our response to them, their you know, attitude towards us as a congregation. But so long as a man remains qualified and continues to do the work, he can remain in leadership. Most elders, most elders resign either because of a family trauma, illness, something like that, that requires his, more of his attention, or because they're, quote, elders, Obviously, they're usually men who are a little further up in, in age, and usually after a while, they just can't maintain the, the pace and the work that is required. I, I feel a great burden for those who take on the, the role of uh, elders because they take on a tremendous moral and spiritual and emotional burden, and I mean, they don't have to do that. They're going to get to heaven just like you and I but they feel a sense of responsibility of having to do that. And, and I say, while a lot of other people are you know, going to the game or taking it easy, they're out visiting somebody. We feel good about you know, our, our participation in church. We're here Wednesday night, which is great, which is edifying, and we're here Sunday night, but they're here Wednesday earlier than everybody else having a meeting. And they're here earlier than everybody else on Sunday having another meeting. And they're the first ones who get called with every, my wife died, my kid got hit by a car, uh, I just had a heart, you know, they're the first people to know all this stuff. They have to carry all this. And yet they volunteer to do it and they do it only because they love the Lord and they love the church. And I think just based on that, they're worthy of, of, of our respect and, and our love. Okay, so let's look at the word, um, uh, deacon, shall we? I said we'd, we'd look at deacon and see if it reveals some information about this particular person and this role in the church. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, Paul writes, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also be, uh, first be tested then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Uh, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. One more verse. Uh, deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. 
So although the idea of service and example of serving is prevalent throughout the New Testament, uh, the word deacon in reference to a person only appears five times and all of those times used by Paul uh, and all of them mostly in one single letter. There is one other instance where there is reference to a particular service that could be referred to as quote deacon's work without using the pronoun for deacon, but uh, Paul uses the verb and the noun derived from the word. And you'll see what I mean by this you know, word study. We're going to do a little word study that the word deacon, the original word in the Greek, it goes a lot of different ways. It can be used in a lot of different ways. Okay? So the Greek word uh, in the New Testament that is transliterated into the English word deacon literally means waiter in a restaurant, a waiter, okay, that's what it means. I want to explain to you the difference between the term translate and transliterate. Okay? Some words in the Bible were translated into other languages, most of the words actually, translated. For example, the Greek word homologeo, which means to, to declare, to proclaim, that's translated from one language, what it meant uh, you know, in another language. Some words, however, were transliterated, meaning that a word was made up in the new language to represent the word in the original language. Usually one that was spelled or sounded very much, uh, very similar. For example, the most common example of this is the Greek word, this is the Greek word, baptizo which if you were to translate it, it simply means to dip or to immerse or to wash in water. But that word was not translated. It was transliterated into the English word baptize. Notice baptizo, baptize. The words sound the same. They're almost spelled in exactly the same way. So in the case of the word baptizo, a new word in English to represent the word in the Greek that was spelled and sounded similar was created. Well, in the same way, in the same way, the Greek word diakonos was, uh, if it was translated, meant a servant or a waiter in English. It was, however, transliterated into the word deacon in biblical text. Sounds a lot the same, you know, diakonos, deacon, now there's a reason, however, why this particular word was chosen to describe this person and his ministry. There were several words in the Greek to refer to those who served. Doulos, doulos, again, these are Greek words, referred to a slave who was taken in war or purchased. It was translated into the English word slave or bond servant. The word emphasized the idea of subordination and forced obligatory service without personal freedom. This was the lowest of the low, because in slavery in the first century there were many categories. This was the bottom. It's interesting, Paul says that uh, this is the form, doulos, this is the form that Jesus took when he became a man. They use the term doulos, the lowest of the low, Philippians chapter two, verse seven. Okay, another word in the Greek, pious. Pious referred to a young person or the child of a slave or a very youthful slave. It was usually the pious who would wash the feet of guests coming in. That was that slave that did that, that work. Oiketes uh, referred to a household servant. Today we'd say a butler or a maid, quite different from a doulos, quite different from a pace. See what I'm saying? They had different categories. Um, uh, Latruo, uh, Latruo, uh, a hired servant or a worker for hiring, many times paid. Huperetio, uh, manual labor, a tradesman, a seaman. Leturgos referred to a public servant or a priest or a minister. We get the English word liturgy from this word. Okay. 
And then, of course, we have diakonos, another type of servant. Diakonos actually in the Greek meant to wait upon, to be an attendant, to render service, to minister. Now, a look at the history of this particular word, diakonos, will help us understand why the Bible writers chose to use this word more than any other. And there are more than just these seven. There are more than seven words describing different types of slaves in the first century. But there's a reason why they chose this particular word to describe the service in the church in general and the special servants that we call deacons in particular. Words in any language go through changes of meanings and it's no different in the Greek language. So, the word diakonos originally referred to the meal attendant, hence the idea of waiter in Greek society. He was the one that served the food. Okay? In this context, it was also used to describe the one who prepared the food for cultic and religious meals and feasts. In Jewish life, there also was a strong emphasis on the importance of food, because not only the pagans obviously offered you know, food to their idols, but the Jews also had ceremonial offerings of food uh, and also food restrictions because of their religion. There's a, there's a link here and you'll see what it is. The Jews had a sense of benevolence and it was custom to collect and distribute food among the poor even before the Christian era. And this was considered an act of benevolence and service by the Jews. So when Jesus comes, he elevates what was common, servanthood. He elevates this to a new level, making it a defining mark of discipleship and identification with himself, which was contrary to the social custom that saw service as something demeaning. You're a what? You're a diakonos? You're a doulos? Wow, you're, yeah, you're at the bottom of the heap. Okay. So again, Philippians 2.7, he became a servant, a servant unto death. So Jesus injected the element of love into the act of service and he recast what was a shameful thing in pagan society into a virtue for members of the church. In this sense, we are all servants in the service of Christ. Now, in its initial stage, the first organized act of service in the church was the need to feed the Grecian widows in Jerusalem for which seven men were chosen to organize and manage. Can you imagine? They had 3,000 people and, then, and the thing was growing. Okay? And among those 3,000, there, you know, there were hundreds of widows. Uh, and they needed food. Imagining, here we have only a few and sometimes somebody is sick, we got one person, one lady that kind of calls everybody up and several families bring food and casseroles. Imagine if you had 300 widows and they all required food and they had to have food every single day. And so they, they, they choose seven men to organize this work. Now, it's interesting to note that the words used in the book of Acts, chapter six, to describe the serving of these widows is the verb form of the noun diakonos. The reason for this is that when it was food being served and distributed and managed, the word for serving or the word for the servant was diakonos or one of its variations. So the link is here. When selecting a word that described the workers and the work done in loving service on behalf of the church by its members, the apostles, and I would say the Holy Spirit, chose a word for servant that had always been connected with personal, attentive, and in some cases, benevolent or loving service of food. With time, the meaning of this word expanded to include two other things, and that was all the service done by Christians was loving service, whether it was for food or anything else. And secondly, those special servants who by virtue of their particular need or their special qualifications, the blessing of the elders, these were appointed to a specific ministry in the church. And what do we call these guys? We call them deacons, because the word perfectly describes their attitude, 
their work and the history of you know, benevolent service attached to this particular Greek word. In other words, there was no history of benevolent service attached to the word doulos. Okay. It's because this word had a history of kind of you know, benevolent service that it was chosen for uh, you know, referring to these type of uh, Christians. So with time, the word diakonos or deacon, referring to the person and all the words derived from this word, referring to various you know, kinds of service, could be primarily used to describe the church workers and the work, unlike other words for service, which I explained to you before. So like many other words that had multiple meanings, for example, the word apostle, it meant messenger. Well, there were a lot of messengers in the first century, Barnabas, they called him a messenger or an apostle, uh, Acts 14, uh, 14, but he wasn't one of the apostles chosen specifically by Christ. Well, in the same way, the word diakonos or deacon would have different meanings based on the context. For example, any servant in the church rendering a service of some kind in Christ was a diakonos. In Colossians 1 verse 7 it says, just as you learn from, it, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow whoop, bond servant, who is a faithful whoop, servant, diakonos, of Christ on our behalf. Was Epaphroditus a deacon? No. But they used that word to describe what he did. Well, he was serving the church. How? He, he went to Paul, he brought Paul a gift and he ministered to him while he was in prison. In Romans, same idea. So Epaphras, Epaphroditus wasn't a deacon, but he rendered diakonos, he rendered service. Okay. What was Epaphras? Well, he was more a preacher because he helped establish the church in Colossae. Uh, Romans 16.1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a whoa, diakonos of the church, which is at Chancrea. Was she a, quote, deacon? Well, she wasn't any more a deacon than Epaphroditus was a deacon. What was she doing? She was rendering service. She's a servant of the church. Secondly, the appointed servants who became, uh, who because rather of their qualifications or the ministry that they fulfilled and the blessing of the elders who served as appointed service uh, in an official capacity, they were called deacons. Well, how do we separate the difference? How do we know when deacon is just referring to somebody rendering a service, or when deacon is used for someone who is officially a deacon? In other words, he was chosen because of his qualifications and he was commended by the elders and so on and so forth. How do we know the difference? Context, context. For example, in Philippians 1.1, Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, that's doulos, okay? To all the saints in Christ, that's the, the entire church, right? Who are at Philippi, including the overseers. Well, who are the overseers? They're the elders or the bishops. And the deacons, well, who are the deacons? Well, they're the men who have been specifically appointed to the task of being a deacon. Because Deacons here doesn't refer to all the church who's serving, it refers to a particular group. So the way to determine when the writers refer to a servant rendering a service, or an appointed servant carrying out an office or a ministry is always context. Another passage here. In Ephesians chapter four, uh, Paul writes, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of, uh, of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So Paul describes, notice here, specific roles for specific people here in the church. All of these people received these offices or ministries based on their abilities, 
Also their spiritual qualifications, the blessing of the church leadership, and each of these is explained further in other parts of the New Testament. In other words, we find out what an elder is in 1 Timothy, we find out what an evangelist is, you know, and all, a teacher and a deacon, so on and so forth. But each of these roles are always explained and defined in context. For example, all members of the church should prophesy, in other words, speak God's word. But only a few had in those days the ability and the anointing by the Spirit to predict the future or to speak on behalf of God without you know, the, full, the, full, uh, con uh, the full text of the Bible having been given to them. In today's church, all members are responsible to evangelize their homes and their community but not all are called and qualified and sent by the elders as evangelists or preachers or missionaries. We should all provide leadership and an example of our faith to the world, but not every member is qualified and called to serve as an elder. Every member should learn and teach each other the word of God, but not all have the skill and confirmation from the church's leaders to teach classes on Bible subjects. You know, everybody does everything, but some are called to do specific things because of their qualifications. So, in the same way, we all serve the body as Christians in one way or another, but not all are qualified spiritually and technically to serve as appointed servants or, quote, deacons with a specific ministry or office. Paul doesn't describe the deacons in Ephesians 4, but he does in 1 Timothy 3. And so, the word deacon can mean any servant in the church, but most times it refers to those who have been selected by the church and appointed by the elders to carry out a very specific ministry and knowing which is which always depends on context. It's not so complicated that we can't figure it out. We just have to understand what the rules are. All right, so next week we're going to look at the qualifications of deacons and also tackle the question always asked, well, can women serve as deacons? Now, there are a lot of opinions about this and we're going to see what the letter of Timothy says about this subject. One last thing for today, what is the essential difference between elders and deacons? A lot of the same qualifications, right? They both serve the church. Well, here's the main differences. First is authority. Elders are given authority to lead the congregation, to oversee it, and deacons are not. They're not given that responsibility. Um, elders, uh, have their ministry is to serve primarily by teaching and the direction, giving uh, deacons, to, uh, giving deacons uh, direction to serve in their tasks. So elders teach and oversee, deacons do service tasks. Again, this is not something I've you know, invented. I mean, this is what the scripture teaches. And then thirdly, elders are appointed by the evangelists or, or the elders that are at the church at the time. Deacons, on the other hand, are selected by the church and confirmed by the elders and or the evangelists. So they're not chosen in the same way. They don't have the same work and they don't have the same responsibility. Two very separate types of ministries, but two very necessary types of ministries in the church. Okay, I think we've got uh, everything we needed to cover tonight. Next week we'll just keep going with, uh, with uh, looking at deacons and tackling those questions. All right, thank you very much for your attention.